Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. St. Louis, Missouri. The Lemp Mansion continues to host the tragic Lemp family, one of America's most haunted places. It was transformed from a stately home of millionaires into an office space, decayed into a rundown boarding house, and finally it was restored as a fine dinner theater, restaurant, and bed and breakfast. Johann Adam Lemp sailed from Germany to St. Louis in 1838. He opened a small grocery store at Del Mar and Sixth Streets and sold the, the usual products and homemade beer, a lighter golden lager that contrasted with the darker ales present at the time. His recipe was much sought after, and after two years down the line, he decided to leave the grocery store business and construct a brewery near the current Gateway Arch. Lemp pioneered the distribution of lager in St. Louis when he began selling beer at a pub attached to the brewery. Soon after, it became clear that the brewery needed more space for production and storage. This led Lemp to uncover a limestone cave nearby. The cave was kept cool by fetching ice from the Mississippi River, and it provided an ideal environment for storing his beer during the lagering process. It was such a success that by 1850, Lemp opened the Lemp's Western Brewery Company, and it had become one of St. Louis's most prominent breweries with a first place win at the 1858 annual fair, solidifying its reputation as a producer of a quality lager. On August 25th, 1862, Adam Lemp died as a millionaire and his son, William, expanded the brewery in a significant manner. In 1864, a new brewery was built. William bought all of the area around the lagering caves. And eventually, as the brewery continued to expand, it covered five city blocks. In the 1870s, the Lemp family symbolized wealth and power as the Lemp Brewery controlled the St. Louis beer market until Prohibition. A house was built near the Lemp Brewery in 1868 by William Lemp's father-in-law. William purchased the house in 1876 and it became his home and his auxiliary office. Even though the house had a lot of room, Lemp immediately began renovating and expanding it into an impressive Victorian mansion. From the mansion's basement, a tunnel was built through the cave through the brewery. Cave parts were converted into natural auditoriums and theaters. Later, this underground oasis would become home of a very large concrete swimming pool, a bowling alley, and hot water from the brewery boiling house. Originally, Cherokee Street had a spiral staircase that led to the theater. The Lent Brewery gained national recognition after introducing the popular Flastaff beer in the middle of the 1890s. During the same period when William Sr. built his own business empire, he also helped Pabst, Anheuser, and Bush start up their companies. The Lemp Western Brewery was the first to distribute its beer coast to coast. William Lemp Jr. became president of the William J. Lemp Brewing Company in November of 1904. As heirs to the family business and vast fortune, he and his wife Lillian began spending the inheritance. They hired servants, bought carriages, clothing, and art all for the house. Lillian was a beautiful woman with wealthy origins, and she married William Lemp Jr. in 1899. Their son, William J. Lemp III, was born on September 26th. Beyond her habit of wearing lavender attire, Lillian acquired an additional nickname, the Lavender Lady. She even went so far as to dye the harness of her carriage horses in matching hues. 
Will was initially proud to have married such an impressive wife, but his entitled mindset was clear. He had been born into privilege and usually conducted himself as he saw fit. A tired William demanded that his beautiful wife spend her time shopping, giving her a thousand dollars a day. He told her that she would have no more if she didn't spend it. Wait a minute, so you're gonna give me a thousand dollars a day and if I can't spend it, I'm not gonna get any more? Oh, oh, William, I'll spend it. During the day, Will ran the brewery while he pursued decadent activities at night. For his entertainment and for his friends, he would bring in several prostitutes to hold lavish parties in the caves below the mansion. In addition to swimming pools, bowling alleys, and free beer, his friends who attended these great events were known to have a really great time, surprising nobody. William's actions, though, had unforeseen consequences. When he fathered a son with someone other than his wife, unforeseen consequences, the guy was partying with prostitutes. I mean, yeah, that seems like something that would probably happen when you sleep around. Although there's no official documentation, tales of the boy living in the mansion attic have been passed down over the years and corroborated by Joe Gibbons, a St. Louis historian. His sources, an old nanny and chauffeur employed at the mansion, confirmed that the child was there. The boy had Down syndrome, and in light of his parents sought to hide away their shame from society. Now referred to as the monkey face boy, he is said to still haunt Lent Mansion today. William Jr. was done with his union to the trophy wife and thus filed for divorce in 1809. It is likely that she stayed with him despite his suspicious activities being a reflection of the era. Being a reflection of the era, he was giving her thousands of dollars a day to just go and just like, you, oh, you better spend this money. I mean, I don't want to sound like a greedy person or anything, but I mean, this is one of the certain things I look over. I mean, true love's great, but you know, watches are pretty nice too. I kid, I kid, I kid. A little bit. A huge scandal in St. Louis followed as all local newspaper outlets broadcasted the details of this on the front page. The trial commenced in February of 1909, which led to many spectators attending the courthouse daily to watch the drama unfold surrounding claims of violence, alcoholism, non-belief, and brutality. While Lillian ignored William's decadent activities, a photograph that was presented at the trial showed her smoking a cigarette, and that almost cost her custody of William Lemp III. In the end, she retained custody of their son, but soon retired from the public eye. The only time she was ever seen in anything other than lavender was on the day of her divorce proceedings, when she appeared entirely in black before the judge. Will's troubles didn't end with the divorce. Nine of the largest breweries in St. Louis had come together to form the Independent Brewing Company of 1906, creating fierce competition the Lemp Brewery had never encountered before. On April 16th of the same year, Will's mother died of cancer. Despite the brewery's continued decline, the Lemp Mansion was completely remodeled in 1911 and partially turned into offices. During this time, William allowed the brewery's equipment to deteriorate without keeping up with the industry developments. By World War I, the brewery was barely getting by. After building a country home on the Merrimack River, William increasingly retreated there and in 1915, he married Ellie Lindbergh, the widowed daughter of the late St. Louis brewer, Casper Kohler. Prohibition came along in 1919, and since the family members were already wealthy, they had little incentive to keep the brewery going. As Will hoped Congress would repeal Prohibition, he eventually gave up and shut down the Lent plant without notice. The workers showed up to work one day and found the doors closed and the gates locked, and that's when they discovered the closing. As her father had done years before, Elsa Lemp Wright, William's sister, committed suicide on March 20th, 1920. She is said to have been despondent over her rocky marriage. The famous Lemp Flastaff logo was sold to brewer Joseph Grilsdick for $25,000. I hope I did not, definitely, definitely did not pronounce that right. There were so many consonants in that name. He sold it for $25,000 in 1922, after William Jr. liquidated the plant's assets and auctioned off the building. It was estimated that the brewery's buildings were worth $7 million before Prohibition, but they were sold for just $588,000 to the International Shoe Company. With William Jr. gone, the Lemp Empire seemed to have finally come to an end, since both Charles and Edwin had left the business long ago. 
After leaving the brewery in 1911, Edwin had chosen to live in seclusion in his state in Kirkwood, Missouri. In place of working in the brewery, Charles had chosen to work in banking and real estate. William Lemp III died of a heart attack at the age of 42 in 1943. Eventually, Brother Charles returned the mansion to its former state as a residence and took up inhabitants alongside two servants and the brother of Wilhelm's illegitimate son. Growing increasingly peculiar with age, he developed a tremendous fear of germs that manifested in his compulsive behavior. Gloves were always on, and he was incessantly hand-washing. Tragically, during this time, the illegitimate boy, who was now in his 30s, passed away at the mansion and was buried in the Lemp Cemetery plot with nothing more than a minimalized flat marker that just said Lemp inscribed on it. As soon as the one known as the Monkey Face Boy died, Charles became the fourth Lemp family member to commit suicide, but not before shooting his beloved Doberman Pinscher in the basement of the house. On May 10th, 1949, one of his staff members discovered Charles still holding a 38 caliber Army Colt revolver in his hand. As he climbed the staircase to the second floor, although the dog was shot in the basement, he was discovered halfway up the stairs. Aw, poor little guy. Edwin Lemp was the sole survivor of the Lemps, spending most of his life in seclusion at the Kirkwood estate. He passed away in 1970, at the age of 90, and according to his wishes, had his butler burn the Lemp family paintings, documents, and artifacts in a bonfire. Taking these unique pieces of history and destroying them forever. With his death, the Lemp family line died out, and the family's resting place can now be found in Bellefontaine Cemetery. In the wake of Charles Lemp's death, the mansion was sold and converted to a boarding house. The house became deteriorated, along with the nearby neighborhood, and haunting stories began to emerge. It was reported that ghostly knocks and phantom footsteps can be heard throughout the house which caused the boarding house to decline to a near flop house status as these stories spread. The old mansion, however, was saved when Dick Pointer and his family purchased it in 1975 and immediately began renovating the building, turning it into a restaurant and inn. Many workers in the house reported ghosts, strange sounds, disappearing tools, and a feeling of someone watching them. In fear of the hauntings, many left the job site to never return. In the years since the restaurant opened, staff have reported a number of strange experiences. Apparitions appear and then disappear. Voices and sounds come from nowhere, and glasses are often lifted off the bar and fly through the air by themselves. The piano bar often plays when no one is present. Doors lock and unlock on their own, and lights inexplicably turn on and off by themselves. The old mansion is said to be haunted by several members of the Lamp family and has the three most active areas are the stairway, the attic, and the basement, which is referred to as the Gates of Hell. They say that the Lemp Mansion attic is haunted by William Jr.'s illegitimate son, the one known as the Monkey Face Boy. People have often seen his face peering from the windows of the mansion. Ghost hunters have tried leaving toys in his chamber and then forming a circle around them, only to find the objects move when they return later. No one knows what's going on up there. Yet one thing is sure. Mysterious occurrences are taking place. There have been reports that men peek over the stalls in the downstairs women's bathroom, which was once William Jr.'s personal domain, and housed the first freestanding shower in St. Louis. One of the first stories of this occurring is when a woman returned from the bathroom to the bar and saying to the two men that she was with, I hope you got an eyeful. However, the two men denied leaving, which the bartender verified. It is said that the ghost represents the womanizing William Jr. It has been reported that guests in William Lemp Sr.'s room often hear someone running up the stairs and kicking at the door. A report indicates that William Jr. ran up the stairs to his father's room when he killed himself, and after finding it locked, kicked the door in to get to his father. Several years ago, a part-time tour guide heard noises outside the room where William Lemp Sr. had kept his office. However, nothing was there when the tour guide looked through the window. The area north of the mansion, now used as a parking lot, was once used for horse tethering. In addition to being featured in many magazines and newspapers, the mansion attracts ghost hunters from around the country. Today, the mansion features a bed and breakfast with restored rooms, a fine dining restaurant, and a mystery dinner theater. Tours of the estate can also be arranged, if, you know, 
You guys are interested. Hey, folks. I uh, wanted to do just a middle of the episode check in here. I know uh, uh, I didn't have an episode out last week. I just wanted to kind of give you an update what's going on. Um, my, the members of my Patreon know, you know, I've been in communication with them, but I haven't really sent out anything on my socials or anything like that. Uh, it's been a wild two weeks for me. Um, let's start with the good. It was, you know, my daughter's first birthday, you know, the holiday weekend, which was pretty great. Um, so I kind of got a little bit pushed back for that and celebrating, you know, my daughter and, you know, spending time with family. I also had, unfortunately, a death in the family and was in a minor car accident. So things like that all happened within probably 10 days of each other. So it kind of put everything else on hold. So I fell a little behind with my podcasting. You know, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I'm guilty of this too. Like if I listen to a podcast, I, I just assume it's like, because now podcasting, you know, in my opinion, has become like the third medium. It's like movies, TV, podcasting. That's the forms of entertainment that people search out. So, you know, movies and TV, those are like professional, like studio kind of things. Podcasting, you know, I'm guilty of it too. I'll be the first to admit it. Like when I listen to a podcast, it's like, oh, that's even though I do podcasting, this is how stupid I am. It's uh, like, hey, this is done in a big studio, and there's a lot of people involved, and there's a, you know, it's, I'm just a guy in his spare bedroom that's sitting in a, a cube of plastic shelves covered in foam pieces. So this is there's nothing professional about this. So when life happens, things kind of slow you down. So I just want to apologize for, you know, missing a week and, you know, going forward. I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep, at least for now, keep the twice a week schedule. So I might have to go back to weekly for a little while until I can get myself caught up with, you know, a little, a lot of the stuff that I got to just got to get finished. But anyway, I wanted to thank everybody, you know, the members of my Patreon. Thank you so much. When after I explained that you guys all reached out to me and said, you know, condolences and you know well wishes and i appreciate every single one of you so thank you so so much you guys know the normal spiel that i do if you like the show share it leave a review all the other nonsense that i spew constantly um about the show but again thank you all so much there is a one particular shout out that i want to give though today josh He's a patron of mine. He's a patron. I keep saying he's a Patreon. I know that's not how it's said, but that's just a website, and then that's what it's in my head. Anyway, Josh, you're a patron of mine. Thank you so much for joining, and I want to give a special, super special shout-out to your daughter, Willow. I love it so much that you say that you listen with your four-year-old, and you're patiently waiting for me to have a new episode out. So, Willow, thank you so much for listening, sweetie. Thank you so much for listening with your dad. That's just the greatest thing ever. And when my daughter is old enough, I hope that I'm able to share something with her the way you guys share something. And just having me involved in that, even if it's so out of the way, if it's just listening to my voice, you guys are sharing something together. And that's just so great. So Willow, thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the show. I enjoy you. Enjoy your dad. Enjoy the time you guys spent together. Again, Willow, hello, and thank you. All right, let's get on with Missouri. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected. Like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. There is a macabre collection of unsettling displays that document the treatment of the mentally ill over the centuries, and it is known as one of the 50 most unusual museums in America. You'll come away from this interesting museum highly enlightened and very glad that you were never a resident. The museum consists of a 19th century dowsing tank and an exhibit of more than a thousand metal objects taken from a patient's stomach. In 1872, Missouri State Legislator allocated $200,000 to be put toward the construction of a quote-unquote lunatic asylum. 
The citizens of St. Joseph were instrumental in getting the legislature to choose their city as the location of the hospital, which opened its doors on November 9, 1874. Named State Hospital for the Insane No. 2, or more commonly known as Lunatic Asylum No. 2, they welcomed their first 25 patients, and with them began the noble mission of reviving hope in the hearts of those suffering from mental illness. This work was done faithfully for over 127 years. Within an instant, all 275 beds at the hospital were taken up by relatives who could no longer provide care for family members with mental illnesses. The hospital then added 120 new beds, followed by 250 more beds, and the numbers only grew over the years as countless mentally unwell people were admitted. When it was first established, this sanctuary could be deemed self-sufficient as patients cultivated crops and tended to livestock for sustenance. By the 1950s, the St. Joseph State Hospital, or the State Lunatic Asylum No. 2, had grown to nearly 3,000 beds. Its patients ran the gamut, comprised of criminally insane individuals, those who were chosen to be rehabilitated, and others who just simply had depression. Unfortunately, some of those suffering from mild depression were abandoned there by their family members. However, as medications improved over time, more and more were able to leave the hospital and rebuild their lives in society. Throughout its history, questionable treatments such as ice baths and electroshock therapy have been implemented in an attempt to cure mental illness. In 1967, George Glor began a museum in a ward of the St. Joseph Hospital, where he dedicated much of his 41-year career with the Missouri Department of Mental Health starting out with 16th, 17th, and 18th century treatment replicas for an awareness exhibit. He went on to curate an impressive collection of items illustrating the progression of mental health treatments. This made it one of the largest collections of mental health care exhibits in the entire United States. After his retirement from government service in the 1990s, Glor had left behind an incredible legacy. By the early 1990s, the majority of the asylum's patients had been released back into society with the help of modern medications. Missouri approved a bond in August 1994 for the conversion of a large asylum campus and hospital into a correctional facility with 108 beds. The new Northwest Missouri Psychiatric Rehabilitation Center opened across the street in July 1997 in a state-of-the-art building across from the original campus. Furthermore, Glor's Psychiatric Museum was forced to relocate from the campus in 1997. It soon moved into a 1968 building, which once served as a clinic for the mental hospital's patients, and now sits just outside the prison gate. In 1999, the Western Reception Diagnostic and Correctional Center was built on the old asylum campus, housing over 1,800 inmates. Visiting the new three-story museum is an unforgettable experience as you get to see the many exhibits that show how mental health has evolved over time. Visit the museum to see treatments such as dousing tanks, cages, straight jackets, dungeons, and electric shock therapy machines. Mannequins in the exhibit demonstrate the unfortunate treatment mentally ill persons were subjected to. And I use the word treatment very loosely because according to this museum, burning at the stake was considered a treatment. They feature a hydrotherapy mannequin, which is just placed in water for hours, and there's one locked inside of a fever cabinet. This cabinet was once used to treat syphilis by raising the person's body temperature with high wattage light bulbs in an effort to eliminate the virus. Occasionally, patients were strapped into the tranquilizer chair for as long as six months, according to the report. The chair was used to treat patients in all manners, including bloodletting with leeches or knives, placing their feet in boiling hot water, and more ice-cold water dousing. How was this treatment? It doesn't make sense. This is just a, this is just a house of horrors. This is where you sent your family? Jeez, is Christ, you people. You're all burning for this one, let me tell you. A coffin-like box called the lunatic box, oh, that's very imaginative, was used during the 18th and 19th centuries to place violent or out-of-hand patients until they calmed down. Yeah, that'll, that's sure to calm them down. I know. Listen, I have a one-year-old now, and I know when she gets crazy, the best thing to do to calm a crying child down is to just restrain them in place. No! No, don't you people, don't you not know anything? 
My goodness. It was the attendant's practice to make these men and women stand in their own excrement for hours in complete darkness until they decided that they were controllable. Huh. I say it a lot on this show, but we really have, as, as screwed up as a lot of things are, we really have come a long way. Several former patients' unique disabilities are featured in more displays. An arrangement of more than 1,400 metal objects is displayed in one glass, including nails, screws, pins, bottles, caps, bolts, and buttons, swallowed over the years by one woman who was found eating a tasty nail in 1929. Despite the fact that this patient survived the efforts of swallowing metal objects in her stomach, she died after the objects were removed from the stomach on the operating table. Wow. I mean, they do say leave well enough alone, so I guess, you know, makes sense there. Glore Psychiatric Museum's second floor contains many exhibits of former patients' artworks and crafts, including fine paintings, embroidery, and ceramic items that look like kindergarten displays. A patient's letters and notes are displayed on a television set in another display. The hospital's electrician was called in 1971 when a male patient was seen inserting a folded piece of paper into a functioning television. More than 525 folded notes and letters, including the writings of the delusional patient, were found in the back once the set was removed. In another exhibit, an ex-patient collected over 100,000 cigarette packages to redeem them for a wheelchair for his ward. Upon discovering his ambition, the hospital purchased a wheelchair and dedicated it to him in 1969. Aww. I know what you're asking. Is the Glore Psychiatric Museum haunted, Chris? Because you're just talking about weird things. Well, many of the unfortunate patients who endured these horrendous cures suffered from insanity as a result of them. They would often die within the asylum, where their tortured souls wandered the hospital corridors, still suffering the mental illness they suffered in life. In addition to the tragically misguided treatments and deaths of its mental patients, the hospital also served as a facility for tuberculosis patients, and many of whom died there. A longtime employee of the Missouri Department of Mental Health, George Glor began collecting macabre items from the previous centuries that depicted the evolution of mental health. The hospital began to gain a reputation for being haunted around this time. The staff began to report sightings of shadowy figures and apparitions just out of the corner of their eyes in the hallways and doorways shortly after George had begun putting together the artifacts. From apparent empty rooms, they felt like they were being constantly watched. One of the patients was known for communicating with the spirits of the building, creating many drawings, poems, and songs that detailed her paranormal experiences. A disembodied voice is frequently reported with screaming, singing, and whispering being heard. A sound of a male voice shouting, get out, has been captured in several EVPs. Female voices have also been heard calling out staff and visitors' names. The old asylum cemetery lies around the block from the museum. I was once the northeast corner of the hospital campus. A monument and a large field are nearby, with the modern prison in view through the trees. The first person was laid to rest here on December 12, 1874, and the last one in October of 1949. This sad place is as disconcerting as the museum itself, because most of its markers bear nothing more than an anonymous number. Though 2,000 souls have passed through this old asylum, only hundreds of graves are marked. No name or date indicates who these faceless victims are. Missouri State Hospital cemeteries were neglected for decades by hospital administrators. Headstones were pushed over and buried in the 1960s because mowing around them was too costly. Family members were usually instructed to bring the clothes they wanted the patient to die in when they brought their relative to the hospital for admission. Many of the patients at the hospital never had a single visitor as family members were too embarrassed or ashamed to come see them. Since their families could not locate them, many died lonely and unclaimed. The cemetery has mostly been restored today, but some of its markers are crumbling. All but a few gravestones are unmarked, and even the nicest monument, erected with the name Ellen Ross on it, 1816 to 1865, has been vandalized. Ellen Ross's name and date are barely legible, and something is missing from the top of the headstone. Who is Ellen Ross? These poor souls appear to have been forgotten after death. 
just like they were in life. I'm Christopher Feinstein, and this is Haunted American History. I'd like to give a shout to my newest patrons, Travis, Karen, Charles, Josh, and Little Willow. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you're interested in joining the Patreon, patreon.com slash Haunted American History, add free episodes, early releases, all kinds of fun stuff. And uh, Discord access. Discord, nobody joins the Discord. My patrons, join the Discord. I'm always in there and just so lonely. Even when I'm recording. I'm recording right now and I'm, uh, the, the Discord's open. If you guys were in there, we could jump on. I could share this and be like, hey, look, look at all the mistakes I make when I record. It's a lot of fun. But anyway, thank you guys so much. Love you. Later, folks.